In the previous video, we showed that every symmetry in the dihedral group DN has a so-called normal form. Uh, symmetry sigma can be factored uniquely as r to the k times s to the l, where r is the principal rotational symmetry. You rotate uh, by you rotate counterclockwise by the angle 2 pi over n, and s is going to be the horizontal reflective symmetry across the real axis. If we think of our n gone as, as the complex nth roots of unity. So we have we have this normal forms. And I should mention that every element in the di dihedral group is uniquely determined by its normal form. So for example, if you have two elements, say sigma and rho, and sigma has a normal form r to the k, s to the l, if rho has that same normal form, r to the k, s to the l, well, that actually means these two things are equal to each other. And so rho and sigma are the same element. Uh, so two, two elements have the same normal form are actually the same element. But what, let's say that you have, let's say that you have uh, two different normal forms for the same element. So sigma looks like r to the k, s to the l, and r to the k prime times s to the l prime. Well, by working this equation right here, multiplying on the left by the inverse of r to the k prime and on the right by the inverse of s to the l, you're gonna see that you get r to the negative k prime, r to the k is equal to s to the l prime times s to the negative l. So we have a, so if you, when you take r to any power, right, this composite is gonna turn out to be some type of rotational symmetry. Which, which one it is, I don't know. And then right here, when you multiply these things together, you're gonna get some type of reflective symmetry. I, I guess I, sh I should say it's a little bit more simple. When you take s to some power, you're either gonna get s or you're gonna get the identity. The identity is not a rotation. So the, excuse me, S is not a rotation. The only way that then a power of S can coincide with a rotational symmetry is if it was the identity, like so. So if it's the identity, that means that the powers of S combine together to get some even number. Um, we have to have it that S to the L prime is actually equal to, equal to S to the L. So that S to the negative will have to be the inverse of S to the L prime. So this would tell us that L prime is congruent to L mod two. Like so, the same thing's happening over here, that the only way that r to the negative k prime times r to k is equal to the identity is that, in fact, r to the k and r to the k prime are actually the same element. Um, that doesn't mean the integers are the same, but they are gonna be congruent to each other mod n, where n is the order, the order of r in this situation. And it turns out this argument right here gives us a way of counting the number of elements in our dihedral group, dn right here. So what, what's going on? So dn, we can claim, actually has order two to the n. And this comes from the normal forms here. So every element in, in dn can be written in the form r to the k times s to the l, where k and l can be uniquely chosen between, so that k must be between zero and n minus one. So there's n options for k, because the order of r is n. And then likewise, l, has to be chosen between zero and one. So you're gonna get two options because the order of S is two. So if you have if you have N options for K and two options for L, you're gonna get N times too many options total following from the fundamental multiplicative principle of counting. So then, then the order of the dihedral group is two to the N, that's great. Now I do wanna mention that uh, there are some group theorists out there that when they talk about the dihedral group, they don't use the notation dn, they use the notation d2n. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is they're using the subscript as describing the order of the group. So it's like, oh yeah, if you take the dihedral group of order eight, you might compare it with other groups of order eight, like the cyclic group of order eight or the quaternion group of order eight. So the subscript is, is describing the order as opposed to the notation we use here uh, where the n describes the 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 polygon that we're describing here, the symmetry groups of said polygon. So in that, so we would say that the order of dn is equal to 2n, but they would say that the order of d2n is equal to 2n, which seems seems clear, I guess. Uh, but then you get in sort of confusing situations like what does d8 represent? Are we talking about the dihedral group of order eight or the symmetry group of the regular octagon? Those two groups are not the same because uh, the symmetry group of the octagon is actually 16. And so when, when you are looking at the dihedral group in any mathematical publication, you do have to make sure which, which notation is the author using, dn or d2n. Uh, dn is the notation we're going to use for our, for our series here. Um, that coincides with Judson's notation um, in, 
in the textbook. It's also the notation I prefer because, again, as, as an algebraic combinatorist, as a representation theorist, to me, it feels very much, it makes sense to be describing the set that the dihedral group is acting on uh, as opposed to just the order of the group. But both of them are commonly used, and I don't even know which one is used more. It might be, even be used equally. So you have to be aware the dihedral group could be denoted as dn or d2n. The 2n notation comes from the fact that the we're talking about the dihedral group of order 2 to the n. So let's consider some of the, the, the dihedral groups we've talked about already. So the symmetries of the equilateral triangle D3, for example, we could orient the vertices of the triangle to be complex roots of unity, and I'm just going to call them uh, 1, 2, 3. So rotational symmetry, R, it would send 1 to 2, 2 would go to 3, and then 3 goes to 1. So that gives us the traditional 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3. Um, for the square, I want to mention to you that if you take this rotation R, you're going to go 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and then 4 to 1. And so you get the 4 cycle, 1, 2, 3, 4. So in general, for the dihedral group, R is going to look like 1, 2, 3, all the way up to N. If you label the vertices in this um, counterclockwise rotation, like we see here on the screen right now. Um, what about S? Well, S is going to be reflection across the horizontal line. Whoops. So in this case, you're going to swap 2 and 3 for the triangle. So you see S looks like the vertex 2, 3. Well, R squared will be to rotate twice. So 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, and then 2 goes to 1. So you get 1, 3, 2. It's also a 3 cycle. Um, this, of course, also coincides with R to the negative 1. It's a counterclockwise rotation. How do you get RS? Well, RS would look like 1, 2, 3, which is R, times by S, which is 2, 3. Notice that 1 goes to 2, uh, 2 goes to 3, which 3 goes to 1. So you get this 2 cycle, 1, 2. And then 3 will remain fixed. 3 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 3. So RS is the reflection across the line that, that leaves 3 fixed. And the idea is you had S, you had at, like the line associated to S right here. You're going to rotate a half angle. And that's where you're going to get your next symmetry right here. And that's where you get RS. And then R squared S is the other one. It's going to be reflection. Uh, reflection, let's see. Oh, that's a typo there. Sorry about that. Uh, that should be the other one. That should be 1, 3. So reflection through 2 right here. Um, the issue, of course, being you rotate this thing twice. And you can compute that. If you take 1, 3, 2, and you times it by 2, 3. Uh, let's see. 1 goes to 3. 3 goes, 3 goes to 2, which 2 goes to 1, so 1 goes to 3 here. And then what happens to 2? Two? 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, so we get the following. Sorry about the typo, 1, 3 is what you get right there for the other symmetry. For the square, um, if we take reflection across the horizontal here, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, so we get this thing right here. If we do a double rotation, 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, and then 2 goes to 4, and 4 goes to 2, so we get this guy right here. Uh, triple rotation is just going to be clockwise rotation. One goes to four, four goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to one, like we see right here. Um, the other ones, I'll let you compute them. Um, what would RS look like? RS, we'll do this one together. So you're going to get one, two, three, four times two, four. So one goes to two, two goes to four, which goes to one. So you're going to get one, two as a two cycle. What happens to three? 3 goes to 4, and then 4 goes to 2, which goes to 3. So you get this 2-2 two, two cycle, um, 1, 2, 3, 4. So with symmetries of the square, you'll notice the following. You have that the horizontal re reflection and the vertical reflection, these ones are perpendicular to each other. That corresponds to S and R squared S. And then the, dia then the diagonal ones, these, rotation these reflections right here, that will coincide with RS and R cubed S. And so that kind of discusses the symmetry groups for these regular indons, which is the dihedral group. Uh, some other symmetry groups that we could also discuss would be like three-dimensional objects, symmetries of three-dimensional objects. Like, let's take the platonic solids, for example. We could take the tetrahedron. Um, the tetrahedron will have as its symmetry group, uh, the alternating group, A4. Uh, the cube will have as its symmetry group, S4, the symmetric group there. And that's something we can talk about at some other time, right? Uh, actually, I think I leave these as homework assignments for my students here. Uh, the octahedron, uh, it'll actually have the same symmetry group as its dual platonic solid, which is the cube. 
And then there's also the symmetry groups for like the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, uh, which ones are a little bit more complicated. So we are not going to talk about those in these series, but it'll be left as a, as a homework exercise to prove the symmetry groups for the tetrahedron and the cube are exactly A4 and S4.